Yeah, that was something I want to go into more. Yeah. Just kind of a yeah. in between the Let's then not over talk it yeah. <laughs> and we talk there because then we will come to think. Photo of this, this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Does it work? Yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session on Saturday afternoon at Tudor's Art Festival. My name is Daniel Erlacher. I'm going to moderate the session afterwards. Uh, birth and death of Europe uh, in the festival's theme of consciousness. Um, and we're going to start actually before the panel with a short uh, journalistic video, 15 minutes long. It's done by Adam Ellick, a video journalist of the New York Times, and it's about what's going on in the Mediterranean right now. Um, I want to warn you, um, also for the small kids in the room, there are some graphic images in the film. 15 minutes, and then we come back on stage with the panel. Thank you. This is me. November 6, 2017. Around 150 migrants leave Tripoli aboard a flimsy raft, desperate to reach Europe and start new lives. Many of them will drown, the result of decisions made by politicians far away in European capitals. Most are fleeing violence and economic desperation in sub-Saharan Africa. And once in Libya, they face new dangers like torture and human trafficking. But to escape to Europe and to safety, they must first cross the Mediterranean Sea. Smugglers force them onto dangerously overcrowded and fragile rafts. In the night, everywhere is dark. I was highly scared. Well, I have no choice but to move into dinghy. I saw many people, rebels, shooting guns indiscriminately. Over the next eight hours, the sea becomes rougher and the raft starts taking on water. Many passengers fall into the sea, some without life jackets. People were screaming, people were shouting, people were crying. Oh my, oh my, oh, I thought that I'm already dead. The migrants' best hope for rescue is their satellite phone. They call the Italian Coast Guard for help. The Italians then alert all ships in the area to the raft's approximate location. They also contact their go-to partner, the Libyan Coast Guard. By the time anyone arrives, the migrant raft is just outside of Libya's waters. In 2016, the European Union and Italy made an abrupt decision to outsource rescue operations here to a new partner, the Libyan Coast Guard. It's a policy with deadly consequences. Together with the research groups Forensic Oceanography and Forensic Architecture, we reconstructed the events of November 6 to show you how this one decision cost at least 20 lives on a single day. Two hours after being contacted by the Europeans, the Libyan Coast Guard vessel arrives first on scene. The Libyan boat was coming on a high speed. The way was so high, so people gushed into the water. Half of the people in the boat fell in the water. We have blurred the migrants' faces to protect them from retaliation. Because I don't know how to swim, I don't swim. Wave your stick me along, take me far. Most people around me, we were scattered. Some people couldn't float, so 
most of them are gone. Watch how close the Libyan vessel gets to the raft, ignoring standard rescue tactics. Some migrants are pulled under. People were buried. The waves sank me in the water and took me far away to where I saw everything. I saw him, he's videoing the people drowning. We obtained footage from this Libyan's phone. We are shouting, help, help, help. There will be no response. They were shouting at people, making dangerous comments. So I was like, what is going on? And then I just saw a ship painted in blue, the road to Sea Watch. They were coming gently, they were coming gently. This is Sea Watch, a German humanitarian rescue operation. They've also been contacted by the Italians and arrive a few minutes after the Libyans. Sea Watch positions themselves at a safe distance. Sea Watch is also recording with nine video cameras and photos because the Libyan Coast Guard has a history of violence towards volunteer rescue groups. They quickly dispatch their small speedboats to reach victims. So everything started quite early in the morning. We got the first message about the distress situation. They also warned us about the presence of the Libyan Coast Guard. They told me that I should tell the crew to be careful and that we should take all measures against aggressions from the Libyan Coast Guard. Of course, the first things coming to my mind are like, okay, what are their intentions? Are they letting us rescue the people or are they going to threat us? Are they even going to attack us with weapons? Is my crew safe in this moment? We all command, stay away. Sea-Watch immediately starts making split-second decisions about who to rescue first. No, try to assist on the other side of the living coast guard. There's a lot of people in the water. Directly at the living coast guard ship. Migrants are scattered in every direction. It's impossible to reach everyone at once. I'm paramedic. I'm in the blue one. In such a chaotic rescue situation, there are a lot of different things in the water. And then you see, okay, it's a body. So we have to go there directly. We have to be there now. These people normally can't swim. Drowning is like a thing of 30 seconds, or maybe a minute. This is me. You know, I was alone, far away. When the Sea Watch locates me, I'm lucky. I didn't think that I'm going to make it. I thought I'm going to die. There were so much people in the waters. We tried to rescue all of them, but there were very big distance between them. At this moment, the frame shows at least nine people in immediate need of assistance. Many more are out of view. This person here, this person is amazing. Yeah, person yeah. Amidst the chaos, Sea Watch notices a desperate hand that is nearly within reach. One of the rescued migrants jumps in to save me. But it's too late. Meanwhile, the Libyans continue to hinder rather than help the rescue operation. And if you're wondering why the Libyans even show up at all, it's mainly to fulfill a deal with the EU that keeps funding and resources coming their way. Saving lives doesn't seem to be at the top of their list. There were like 12 soldiers who were just standing there and were screaming. We tried to communicate with them that they should just be silent. When they're silent, we can at least hear where other people are screaming. As the rescue continues, the Libyans turn increasingly confrontational. It's part of a long-standing pattern of threatening humanitarian workers. We have been monitoring you for the last two days. Do not come back close to our waters. Next time you will be targeted. This is Europe's preferred partner in action. The Libyans have even boarded other NGO ships by force and fired on them. These past incidents are on the minds of Sea Watch as they approach the Libyans on November 6. If you put that all together, the threat level in the minds of our crew is very high. 
driver of the speedboat said that they are facing big aggressions from the Libyans. He said they're threatening to shoot us. They made signs like this and like holding like weapons like this. Suddenly, the Libyans begin hurling hard objects and potatoes at the Sea Watch crew. It's not only a potato, it's like a very physical attack on, on, on one of our um, crew members. And that makes me very angry. The threats escalate. Sea Watch is forced to retreat for their own safety. Without Sea Watch filling in the gaps, the incompetence of the Libyans' rescue efforts is on full display. Why they are saving people? Why they were saving people? They can't do anything because they have no capability of taking people who are already in the water to their ship. This man begins to sink. His life could be saved if the Libyans deployed the raft mounted on their vessel. But they claim it's broken. They throw life jackets, but it's not enough. He drowns. They have a boat like what the Sea Watch people use. It was there like for decoration. The Libyan Coast Guard, it's, there's, it's not a rescue boat, it's just a warship. They don't have the speedboats, they don't have a medical treatment area, they don't have doctors. There's no chance for good rescue. Botched rescues like this were almost unimaginable just a few years ago, when European countries were still leading rescue efforts. Between 2013 and 2014, Italy alone saved more than 100,000 lives. But then, everything changed. Nationalism and anti-immigrant fervor spiked. So Europe decided to stop the flow of migrants at any cost, without getting its hands dirty. It's a cynical solution, outsourcing the responsibility to the Coast Guard of what is essentially a failed state. The EU provides the Libyans with millions in equipment and training. Italy even helped repair the very ship used in this rescue and paraded it in front of the media to make it seem like they solved the crisis. But they haven't. Eight of the 13 Libyans manning the November 6 rescue received EU training, including on human rights. Yet they blatantly abused the migrants on board their vessel. They started beating me. That is what I get it, this injury. It's why I have a wound they use bread, bread to beat me. Flog, they use flog us, flog us with rope. Beat us, kick everybody, kick, kick, slap everybody, beat me, and I jump into the sea again. Many migrants frantically jump back into the water, even though some can't swim. I'm trying to see when I, when I jump inside the water, because I swim to meet the small boat. You were not afraid that you would die in the water? But I prefer to die in that water for me to, uh, to, for me to go back to Libya. Because if I go back to Libya, they can, they can kill me. After being beaten, this man jumps from the ship. He clings to the ladder. The Libyan ship still takes off, ignoring all pleas to stop. An Italian Navy helicopter realizes their partners have gone too far and intervenes. Only then do the Libyans pull him back on board. The fate of those who survive hinges on which boat they end up on. Those rescued by Sea Watch will be taken to safety. While those on the Libyan boat are taken to detention centers where migrants are often beaten, raped, held for ransom, or sold for slave labor. When we are in the boat, these guys were with me. This guy was captured by a Libyan Coast Guard. We tracked down two of the migrants who were brought back to Libya, and we interviewed them by phone. So they took us back to the deporting camp. So they locked us in a room. Hunger, beating, so many type of things that I've not seen in my eyes before. They will tie you down, 
and we use electric wire, electric wire to chalk you. Did they sell you or trade you to other groups? Yes, 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 yes. we were sold to another group. These two Nigerians, a student and a waiter, later escaped the detention camp. They spoke to us from a secret location where they were hiding. And are you safe now? No. And you can't go outside. No food, no freedom, nothing, nothing. We are planning to leave the country. Even though it's dangerous? It's more dangerous to stay. One of the migrants eventually escaped and reached Europe. The other remains trapped in Libya. The Libyan Coast Guard is not rescuing these people, they're endangering these people in the moment, and that they're killing people. It's an act of murder in the end. In Europe, we know we can't kill people at our border, but if Libyans do that, it's Libya. And it's Africa, and then, yeah, Africa is a sad story, and then we can live with that. But still, it's European money who's leading to people drowning uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. Every European citizen should be very upset, actually, with this kind of approach. Europe likes to think it is a beacon of tolerance and human rights, but its actions tell a different story. It's not my wish to go on rubber dengue. It's not my wish. I just want where I want safety. Safety is what I'm looking for. We are suffering in Libya. We are suffering here. I'm pleading to the European Union to do more, to please, to do more to assist, to assist and to, you know, to save people's life. Okay, um, welcome on stage, Pia Klemp and Sadechko Horvat. Okay, um, I'm going to introduce the speakers and then we're going to speak about um, the topic of the film. First of all, um, let me introduce Pia Klemp. Um, she's a captain. Um, she worked for... Um, for the Sea Shepherd Organization Saving Animals for quite a few years, but also since 2016 on two different ships, also part of the Sea Watch Organization Saving People's Life in the Mediterranean. Welcome, Pia. Thank you very much. And also on stage, uh, Sadej Kohorbat, Croatian philosopher, activist, and writer. Um, he's a, he's a co-founder of the DM25 organization, Democracy in Europe Movement, and he's part of the uh, steering, organizing, commu coordinating committee of Democracy in Europe. And his latest book is called The Poetry from the Future, published this year. Welcome, Saletko. Thank you. <clears throat> and yeah, um, the panel is called Life, uh, Birth and Death of Europe. The birth, because of Greek mythology, Europe being born in the Mediterranean, but right now we also see, as we can see, or still going on, see a lot of people die in the Mediterranean. Um, we're going to start this session with a more analytical level. I'm getting a first-hand experience from Pia, um, but I would also ask you, the audience, already in, after 30 minutes or so to come in. If you have inputs to give, you can raise your hand and participate in, in our session. 
Let's start with this analytical part. Um, what's happening on the ground? We just saw the video, and I want to ask Pia to tell a bit your experience from this work with Sea-Watch on the ground. Yes, like quite a few things were already mentioned in this video, like, for example, that um, the European Union is handing over the dirty work of the fortress Europe and closing the, the borders to those um, in need by financing Libyan militias and just renaming them the Libyan Coast Guard. Um, like, yeah, you might have seen in the background of the, um, of the footage in this video in the same time that uh, we were conducting this rescue operation, there was also a French and a Italian warship that were right at the scene, um, which did neither help with the rescue of the people nor interfered with the um, kidnapping of the, those migrants by the um, Libyan militias back to the detention camps. And it's very important to realize that this is not a, a lone standing single horrible accident that happened there. This is very much the essence of the politics of the European Union today, and it has been for quite a while, and it is very much continuing to going that way. Um, the European Union refused a few years ago to um, support Italy when it was running the rescue operation Mare Nostrum. Very clearly, the other European member states said that they have no interest whatsoever to support um, the Italian Navy and Coast Guard with that. Uh, the result of that was that this operation was stopped altogether. Then the Frontex started Operation Sophia, which had not as a priority to rescue people. The ships are more and more moved towards the north, so even by accident, they cannot find people in distress. By now, this operation is cancelled all together, knowingly that there is still a lot of people that have to take the route via the central Mediterranean, because again, the European Union is not offering any chance of safe and legal passage for these people to reach Europe and take up their human right of um, claiming asylum. So this is a very planned, very made situation that we have. Anything that you see from the Mediterranean, all this footage, it's not, it's not a natural disaster, it's not a catastrophe. This is what the European Union decides border policies to be like. And it's not only Italy that is doing that. Italy, by its geographically, uh, geographic uh, position, is at first hand more involved than others because you have to bring the people to the closest port of safety that is then very often Lampedusa or it is um, then Malta. Uh, but it is the European Union as a whole that is deciding on these policies at the first hand that is uh, financing the Libyan militias that is uh, deciding on the fortress Europe in the, in the first place, that is stopping Operation Sophia, that was not supporting um, Mare Nostrum, and who is also hindering and criminalizing the work of the rescue NGOs that are operating in the central Mediterranean. It is states like Italy that are more and more criminalizing the, the work that we're doing down there, but it's also Malta that has been um, hindering our work a lot by not letting us into port, by not letting us out of the ports. It is um, governments like Germany, Sea-Watch and Juventus run by um, organizations that are based in Germany. Again, Germany is not doing anything whatsoever, neither to support the rescues nor to stop the criminalization. And also very important, especially here to mention, is that the Dutch government is very much involved in this um, murder of these people. The, both the Juventa and also the Sea Watch 3 are running, uh, are flying the, the Dutch flag. That's the, yeah, the flag state, the, the, the government in charge, and very much uh, like the other um, European member states, the, the Dutch are trying to make our work impossible by doing everything they can to stop the operations and to keep the ships from, from yeah, leaving port. And we saw in the film like really, really horrific situations where they throw objects, where they shoot at people. Did you also have personal experiences like shown in that movie? I was the captain on that ah, uh, you were mission. Part of this yeah. ship. Okay, okay. I was on board there, and I think it's 
every NGO vessel that um, is or has been operating in the central Mediterranean had encounters with the Libyan Coast Guard, which were all extremely aggressive, um, different levels if it's just they speed up towards your ship and they circle around you and they present their, their weapons, their big machine guns, so there's yeah, shooting in the air, there's the, like you've heard and seen in the video, the, the radio calls where you're told that if you follow them, if you come closer, they uh, will shoot at you, they will target you, and I think that's an experience that every ship had on different levels, but every uh, NGO vessel in the Mediterranean encountered. Um, I read online that just your two ships that you were on board of in total saved 14,000 people. Is that correct? The Juventa, um, which is a ship that has been seized for two years now in, um, in Italy without any proof of wrongdoings, has been operating for one year. And with the Juventa alone, uh, around 14,000 people have been saved. And Sea-Watch, uh, with the different ships that uh, they have been running over the years, saved uh, almost 40,000 people. Wow, that's impressive. Let's give them an applause for that. Uh, Sredko, you're more uh, not captain of a ship, but you're a captain of an important organization that is politically very active in Europe. Uh, but I'm sure you have maybe some uh, experience also because Yanis from Yanis Varoufakis in Greece, Greece also being a hotspot of the crisis. Maybe you can share a bit of your experience in, in the topic. Yeah, first, first of all, uh, I'm really glad to be here, uh, especially because of you, because I really respect what Pia is doing and people similar to her and your teams and so on. Uh, I think we need more people like you.
the luck to follow the situation closely when uh, uh, Julian Assange, uh, who is now at Dublin's prison in Britain, uh, and I was at that time at the Ecuadorian embassy, have anything to do with the publishing, but I was there when it was published. Uh, where WikiLeaks published on the one hand, one hand Hillary Clinton emails, and on the other hand, uh, uh, they first published about uh, Operation Sophia. And what they revealed in the Hillary Clinton emails is not what you will hear today. No one speaks about it today anymore. They actually demonize Assange and they want to extradite him to the United States to bring him to Max, Supermax prison for 175 years. What was revealed, and I'm hoping here so we can have a debate, what was revealed in the WikiLeaks DNC uh, emails and what is the emails by Hillary Clinton or sent to Hillary Clinton was the following. That the French Secret Service came to India, they realized that uh, Muammar Gaddafi, who in my, don't take me wrong, who in my mind is no hero at all, who is a dictator and so on, who had a plan to implement something that would be called the uh, golden dinner. Uh, in, in Libya, which was a, a, a mean to create a pan-African union. Uh, why is this important? Because Gaddafi and Libya at that time, that was before 2011, before Obama, and Hillary, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State under Obama, before they intervened in Libya, uh, Libya, the mic is back, so I'm not shout so much anymore. Uh, the <coughs> Libya had uh, a reserve of gold of 150 tons, almost 150 tons, and almost the same amount of silver. If you're an idiot like me, you probably cannot imagine what kind of amount of gold this is. Uh, so it's around 7 billion US dollars. Uh, again, for us uh, mortals, it's very difficult to imagine it, uh, but immediate, it, it immediately posed a danger for the French Central Bank, who was in control of the Western Central African Bank. Uh, uh, because, of course, by introducing a currency in Africa, uh, uh, you would get uh, uh, a weaker dollar and you would get also, they would get rid of the French franc, which was still existing at that time, I don't know today, probably yes, in Libya. Uh, so you had an intervention, uh, uh, the French Secret Service convinced Sarkozy, at the same time you probably remember, and it's a disgrace that that person is still called a philosopher, uh, Bernard and Lee Levy, uh, who was going to Libya, making big photos, uh, uh, asking the West, it is always the same scenario, to intervene, and then he called Sarkozy. Uh, of course, Sarkozy was, in co I'm simplifying a lot, uh, in contact with Hillary Clinton, and an intervention happened. You can even, I'm sorry we didn't plan to show it, you can see a very short video by Hillary Clinton uh, at the moment uh, when they ask her, there, there are two videos, one when Gaddafi died, he's laugh, she's laughing very happy, and the other one where she says, we came, we saw, he died, and she laughed. The consequences of this laughing of US, France, and the European powers you can see in this video today, and we are still living the consequences today. Now the other mic. <laughs> I think Hillary Clinton maybe intervened and. So give you my mic and I continue shouting. <laughs> At least you don't have a problem with electricity. <laughs> well, you have to. Yeah, okay. Back. <laughs> so you mentioned that Libya. I mean, we can call Libya, it's obvious, and yeah, not just me, but Libya is a failed state. There is the rule of the stronger, as we can say, and Europe plays, like Srečko said, an, an, a huge role in that. 
How do you see, I mean, how can Europe do this? I mean, obviously this is known in Europe. So what is your take, Pia? I mean, how do you, how do you think is this compatible with European values? Why is Europe really outsourcing it there where obviously there is no functioning system? How, what is your position on that? Um, that's a very many-layered question or answer that is uh, required. There's a big difference, in my opinion, between the alleged values of the European Union and the reality of what the European Union is and what the European Union wants to be and where it sees um, itself. This is not, again, not an accident and something that ah, slightly got out of the way. Um, we are very much um, wanting to protect our our wealth, our space, keeping this difference going, have the othering, be able to keep exploiting, to yeah, keep our uh, capitalist prime position here. And this is just a very logical consequence of wanting to keep this imperialistic um, lifestyle that um, we we have very, very clearly here. So to me, it's not a question of like, oh my God, how could this happen? It's more a question of like, why are we pretending to be surprised it's happening? This is what the European Union is meant to be like. Yeah, and that brings me also a bit to the to a deeper question, because why are people, why do people have to leave? There is a, there is a big, uh, well, of course, a big history going on. Maybe Srećko, you want to go a bit into that. It's not a surprise, like Pia said, and it's going on for a long time. And it's obviously uh, probably not getting better. Yeah, I, this, I think mine works, or not. Yeah? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I have luck. But, uh, 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 okay, I have to stop joking. It's a serious topic, but I think we, we also need to joke, especially if we want to have a future, but not yeah, about this. Uh, we mentioned we went back to 2011 when the intervention in Libya happened. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, I think uh, as you, since you mentioned capitalism, and I'm really glad you did, I'm really glad they are captains who are against capitalism because usually captains are, you know, working for capitalism, uh, transporting uh, uh, the majority of goods transported today. Uh, that's why China wants, wants to build a railway across the world, are still 90%, I think, are transported by, by ships. Uh, and most of these captains are actually uh, uh, helping capitalism, the free circulation of goods. Uh, so, uh, speaking about capitalism, I don't know how many of you recently noticed that uh, uh, one of the leading figures of uh, so-called world systems theory, uh, Immanuel Wallerstein, uh, died. Uh, Immanuel Wallerstein was together with Giovanni Arrighi and some other, and Sami Ramin, who also unfortunately died from Egypt, who lived in Senegal. Uh, they, they were the founders of a theory which looked at capitalism not as something which was created, you know, with neoliberalism, with the period of financialization in the 70s, or which goes back to the tulips and so on, but actually a period which, yeah, goes back also to the tulips, a period of several centuries. And the very fact that we are sitting today here in this, guy, on, in this building, which is amazing, I think, and that there is this concentration of wealth, uh, uh, especially in Western Europe, uh, uh, is due to the fact that Europe, for several centuries, and this should be described as capitalism, uh, was extracting value, extracting resources, uh, extracting humans, uh, mainly from, from Africa, but also other parts of the world. Uh, today, it's similar. Uh, uh, you will know pre better, but I think in Italy, there are almost half a million of illegal migrants who work on the uh, tomato uh, 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 fields and so on, which are controlled by the mafia. So again, you have the extraction of humans in order to become a very cheap labor force. Then if you look at your mobile phones and technology and so on, you will see again that it is again Congo, uh, where 10 million people were killed already by Leopold and by the Belgians, uh, uh, is uh, again becoming a battlefield for extraction of very valuable materials uh, like lithium and so on. And the same as Libya, what you have in Congo is a failed state. Uh, although I don't really like the term because I think it's kind of liberal perspective, you know, that as if Western liberal democracy is an answer. And we can see today that it's not. It's precisely in Western liberal democracy where the European Commission 
is uh, having under Ursula, Ursula uh, a new job which is uh, uh, aimed at protecting, quote, European values. So fast forward from these several centuries of capitalism in Europe, what you have today is that the boomerang is coming back. Uh, European demography and uh, 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 natality is not really going very well. Uh, Germany in the next few decades will have, I think, I don't know the exact figures, but I think around 10 million inhabitants less. I come from Croatia. In Croatia, you have already empty villages uh, because of the very, very bad economic situation. Most of the young people, the same as Greece, you mentioned Greece, are emigrating to Europe. And at the same time, uh, the highest rising populations are in India, China, and Nigeria. Uh, so according to all scientific data and projections in the next decades, uh, you will on the one hand have a fall of the European population, which is already getting older, and probably, as most of you know, also the young people are not really uh, having babies and so on, which is due to other factors, which we can connect it to capitalism, I would say, as well. And on the other hand, you have a big population rise. At the same time, you have climate crisis, uh, which means that most of these populations which are based in the global south, uh, Bangladesh, for instance, if you have one meter of sea level rise, you will have millions of people just only from Bangladesh trying to reach Europe. Uh, so what we are facing here, I think this is not an image from the past, it's an image from the future. Uh, from a future which might be even worse than this because the numbers will be much bigger and the current reaction of the European Union and our governments, Croatian government, I'm blaming my government as well, who are at the moment beating refugees on the border with Bosnia. I'm blaming the Dutch government as well, the Italian government and all other European governments as well uh, because the current response to the refugee crisis or however you call it, uh, is not sufficient. And in 20 years, this response, just because of big numbers and the change of geopolitical situation, climate and so on, uh, will be an even more response from the past. So the, yeah, the situation is pretty boring. Sorry. And also what I thought about this, um, if you think about many European governments, I mean, from Austria, where I come from, Luckily, not right now, but Italy, for example, or many other countries, the right-wing populists are driving uh, the political scene. Even the conservative parties are aligning with the bad values of the right-wing. The right-wing, again, uh, profit in a way uh, that this can scare people with this situation in the Mediterranean. I've been wondering, what do you think? I mean, is there some policy that it's, it's really in place to keep that up, to benefit a certain right-wing ideology? Is this like happening so much on purpose that they, that is actually being used for European politics. Do you think it's the situation created what we see here is really on purpose and will be driven on purpose by the right wing um, populist in government to keep this situation up so they can generate the fear at home and win elections? Um, I think it's uh, dangerous to think that it's just the these populists and the, the right wing, because it's very much uh, consensus almost uh, within the European um, Union, and it's not done with uh, blaming like a very open fascist like Salvini for being the, the evil of Europe. Like, of course, he is evil, but he is not what created this situation, um, nor only the people that um, voted for him. This is um, much broader because it's not just about the question of like, oh, should these people die? Yes or no? No, I think it's much nicer if they don't have to die. It also comes with a lot of consequences. And there every day, there's a lot of us deciding for a lifestyle, for a system that is very much supporting um, the reality that we've seen here. And like you said, that uh, will just become uh, even heavier and more difficult. Like last year, there was 70 million people um, on the move that had to flee um, their, their homes. That's twice as many as just a decade before, and especially with uh, the climate catastrophe um, that will hit very hard, and again will hit the, the global south um, the hardest. There will be so many more million people um, that will have to move, that have no other chance, and I don't see in um, our broad society um, a will to or the, the realization of how much has to change, how much uh, we have to give up on 
privileges and power to work against that. So it's um, yeah, very much pro going against the, the right in all forms of populism, but it's, it's dangerous to only see the blame there and not with our um, daily behavior. Yeah, if I, I completely, completely agree, uh, because I think it's also this kind of liberal game, you know, to always blame the right-wing populists who almost as if they fell from the sky, you know, there is no historical reason why the right-wing populists are coming. Uh, and the, the, the way you pose the question, I think it, it reminded me when a few years ago, uh, I was doing a documentary for Al Jazeera when we also visited Idomeni, uh, Caleb, and in the meantime, we visited Budapest in Hungary, and I had the honor, I'm being cynical now, to talk to uh, the boss of Jobbik, uh, of the right-wing populist, uh, uh, fascist, you know, they were, they were requesting a register for Jews a few years ago, and Muslims in Hungary and so on. So I met this guy, it was a very, well, weird meeting, uh, and uh, he said, our problem for Jobbik, uh, our biggest problem now is that Viktor Orban is actually implementing most of the measures we were advocating. Uh, and I think the same could be said to, to a certain degree also for other right-wing movements and governments who are in power already. Like, uh, uh, I don't think that the problem is so much Alternative für Deutschland in Germany, as the problem is that CDU and the current government in Germany is becoming something what Tariq Ali would call an extreme center. And you have the same situation in Austria, you have the same situation in other countries, where basically the governments, Western governments of Europe, are already implementing something what a decade ago would be perceived as right-wing uh, extreme politics. And why are they doing it? Well, they're doing it not to protect European values, as the European Commission wants to convince us now, they're doing it, as Pia said already, to protect wealth. And uh, uh, why are they protecting wealth? Well, in order for us to have this kind of lifestyle. Or the other way around, it can also be dialectical. We have this kind of lifestyle precisely because the accumulation of wealth of a rich minority is being based on the extraction of value of natural resources, like, for instance, oil, uh, take what's happening now with Saudi Arabia, uh, where the U.S. wants to provoke a new war with Iran, which I think would have disastrous consequences for the whole planet, uh, where, again, just if you watch the images, you know, if you know nothing, if you're an alien, and if you come to planet Earth and you see the images of a tanker with oil, pose yourself a question, you know, didn't we see this image already for all these decades ago? So some white male idiots usually, and Hillary, of course, are attacking boats with oil, which are then polluting the planet, and this oil is also polluting the planet and so on, and then you have big lobbies of the car industry, uh, flights and so on, basically all industry which are heavily relying on oil so that we can lead our current lifestyles. Uh, luckily, on the other hand, so that we don't just leave a very pessimistic taste, uh, I think this is changing. You've seen what happened yesterday with uh, one of the, I think it's the biggest, uh, ecological protest in human history, uh, biggest numbers. I think only in Berlin you had 270,000 people, uh, which is really huge. Uh, 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 it, it is even bigger than Untailbar and this protest which happened before. Uh, you had people in New Zealand, Australia, and so on. Greta is in the States. Uh, movements like DM25 or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, are talking more and more about the Green New Deal. So I think what is changing really is that uh, unlike the situation before, I would say, let's take the first oil crisis in the 70s. It coincides with uh, uh, also the rise of the ecological movement. Uh, and at the same time, at that moment, I think the ecological movement was really kind of hippie, utopia. And, you know, they didn't really have concrete plans. And of course, we also didn't have the technology we have today, which we can use in order to have a green transition, which would be a just transition. So on the one hand, you have this dystopia, anti-utopia. But on the other hand, I think something is boiling. Uh, with Fridays for Future, with Extinction Rebellion, with political parties from the Democrats represented by Bernie Sanders or Alexandria Cortes, or even Labour in Britain and European movements, which are now advocating more and more a Green New Deal. This is just the beginning because there are, of course, many problems with the Green New Deal. Uh, like, for instance, you cannot have a Green New Deal again 
only in the Netherlands, you know, what will happen with Congo. You cannot have a Green New Deal only in the US or Germany, energy vendor in Germany, and then export diesel cars uh, to Hungary, Austria, Croatia, or Belgrade, which is suffocating in air pollution. Uh, so in that sense, what all this situation, I think, points to is that we need radical internationalism, uh, which would be more than just, you know, a socialist, communist, whatever movement. It would be an ecological movement. Uh, it would be it would do the same things what you do in the same way that, you know, the human beings, but not only the human beings, uh, but also animals. I know that you work for Sea Shepherd, that all this is connected and important and that we need this kind of holistic view on the situation if we want to get out of it. Speaking about holistic, I also want to bring you and the audience in. So think about a question or a comment for the session. Just one final uh, question here for the, um, for the panel. Um, you mentioned climate change, of course, the big protests yesterday. Um, as we know, um, the Syrian war was triggered by climate change because many people went to the cities and then became a protest movement. It, it, ha it played a big role. Climate change will bring more people to, to have to leave their own countries. How do you see the effect? What, do you, what is your outlook for the future in terms of climate change and migration? I think it's going to be extremely brutal. I think it's going to be extremely deadly. I think... Uh, like already it's very obvious that everything that's uh, connected to being on the move or having to flee is being illegalized and criminalized. And of course, this is just going to increase the more the number of people increase that um, will have to move. And again, with the political situation of the global south and so on, their lobby is pretty much uh, non-existent. Uh, they have yeah, very little... Uh, economic or political strength. So, yeah, I'm unfortunately pretty certain that this is um, going to be yeah, very deadly and violent, what we will have to see there. I talk too much, so I leave. <laughs> and I agree, but... <laughs> so, I'm giving the floor to you. Questions or comments into the discussion? Otherwise, Sredko will talk for a while. Yes, please. <laughs> Do we have a microphone? I have the only one. Okay, I'm coming. Hi, uh, this question is actually for Strykel. Um, It's really interesting that you propose international socialism as a solution, which I think I kind of agree with. I mean, if you look back Would in you history... speak a bit louder? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> it's really interesting that you're proposing international socialism or internationalism, new internationalism as a solution to the current crisis that we're facing on an international level. Uh, but how would you see that being accepted? And how, what, uh, how do you see the challenge in terms of uh, branding new internationalism as an alternative to globalism, uh, which has such a bad press? So I feel like there's no actual history of new internationalism. There's no, uh, there's no consciousness of what this is and what this movement has been and what this could possibly achieve. So how do you see, what, what do you see the challenges and how do you see the solution in actually branding this uh, in order for it to be implemented by, uh, as you say, a multinational, on a multinational level? Thanks a lot. Um, shall I answer immediately or, yeah. Uh, well, incidentally, I could have been born anywhere else, but I come from a country which was called Yugoslavia. And uh, Yugoslavia was, so perhaps the consciousness about internationalism is not so present in the West, except that 68 it was in Germany uh, with the student uh, uh, rebellion, but also with RAF, if you want, there was a consciousness uh, that what, what is happening in Vietnam concerns us in Germany as well. So I would say 68 maybe was the last period when you had this kind of internationalism, but I come from a country called Yugoslavia, which uh, was one of the founders of something what was called the non-aligned movement, uh, which was founded by Tito, Nehru, and Nasser, uh, Bandung 54, and then 61, the first uh, non-aligned conference in Belgrade. Uh, why is this important? Because that was an attempt precisely of the Global South uh, to come together, uh, uh, countries such as Egypt, India, uh, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was in the middle of Europe and it didn't belong neither to the capitalist bloc, neither to the Soviet bloc. It was never part of the Soviet bloc. Uh, and what they did and what they showed it's possible to do is to build cooperation between the weaker states. 
Uh, uh, although my problem with that, I think we need a similar, similar experience like that. Although, as you can see, uh, when it comes to radical left states, uh, we're not in a situation in which we were a decade ago, when, for instance, Latin America had several left governments, when Syriza came to power, you saw what happened in Greece and so on. Uh, but we are very far from that scenario. We are even very far from Bernie Sanders having power in the United States or Corbyn having power in Britain. And even if they come to power, who guarantees that they won't end up like, as Alexis Tsipras? Uh, uh, which is not a reason not to aspire to come to power and try to change the situation. But what I see changing, unlike, unlike the non-aligned movement, is that we are more and more approaching a situation which, in which the concept of sovereignty will change. Uh, uh, which is already changing. You can see it here in this situation as well. Uh, well, you know, Europe outsourcing uh, 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 the refugee question, basically Italian boats helping the Libyan Coast Guard and so on, but it will become even more radical. On the one hand, you will have libertarian utopias like Peter Thiel, Elon Musk and so on. On the other hand, because of climate change, rising sea levels, I think we will more and more come to a situation where uh, the classical concept of serenity will completely change. And it's already changing. Two days ago, I was in Serbia and Belgrade. Uh, did you know that uh, China installed its surveillance system in Serbia, Huawei, uh, that Chinese police forces are now operating together in Belgrade with Serbian police, and that uh, uh, you also have uh, Chinese drones now being bought by Serbian government. So if on the one hand, I also witnessed Frontex uh, when I was flying in from Athens to Belgrade one year ago, and on the other hand, you already have China. So I think this situation is changing, and in that sense, to end with, the, with, with, the, with, with my answer, uh, we need a redefined non-aligned movement, because national states might also become part of history, uh, uh, or they will become privatized states, as uh, science fiction dystopias like The Circle, where, you know, a Silicon Valley company will have an island and their own sovereignty and so on. And we need to move in another direction, I think, which would be much more radical. We also had the experience of the World Social Forum, as you know, uh, uh, which happened in Latin America, then it went to Mumbai, to Senegal, to Tunisia, and so on. It was 50,000 people gathering every few years from Via Campesina. I'm sure that uh, 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 you would also come there and captains would come there because that was the attempt to get together people who are from different wakes of lives uh, uh, and who are not necessarily part of a political party or so on, who should work together. So if I imagine this new internationalist and by that I end internationalist movement, it would not only consist of political parties uh, which would advocate a progressive program like the Green New Deal, not only of movements, but also of whistleblowers, uh, hackers, captains, uh, uh, people who try to protect animals because the animal issue is directly connected to climate crisis. And I think the previous movements kind of failed when it comes to that. Either they consisted only of states, like the non-aligned movement, or like the World Social Forum, they were just a social forum, just a gathering. Uh, like this here, you know, this is a gathering which I think is great. We need these spaces more and more. Uh, but we also, once we get out of this room, we need something more which is called Concrete organization, organization, organization. Uh, stop. <laughs> I have some more questions, of course. <laughs> um, one thing I want to, to get into is the role of the media in Europe. Um, Pia, maybe uh, a question for you. Um, how was it with the Sea Watch? You had some positive, um, I guess, some like supportive uh, reporting done in Europe, also in New York Times, making this an issue. But there might also be media, or there has been media coverage where it goes in another direction, that you are accused of bringing the people in or encouraging, actually, uh, people to leave Libya in this situation. Can you reflect a bit on the media's role in this kind of scenario? Yeah, the um, way that uh, the work of the civilian sea rescue has been presented in the mainstream media um, changed uh, a lot over the last few years and took a few different turns, where maybe three years ago it was the story of these beautiful young people that go out to sea and heroically save people which was also definitely not 
portraying the actual issue at hand, which is people have to die at our borders because we don't let them uh, come in in a safe and legal way. But from this very yeah, naive portrait of um, the very political work that has been done in the Central Med or also in the Turkey-Greece um, route, for example, um, changed then a lot where all of a the sudden um, there was this very big right shift in the discussion where everything had to start with you have to explain yourself, like, are you not a pull factor? Are you working together with smugglers? Are you the reasons why people are in the very first place um, leaving their home countries? And yeah, everything circulated um, around that, which then if you throw enough dirt, something will stick. It doesn't matter at the end uh, what all you can uh, disprove, how many studies there are to um, that go very clearly against all these false um, allegations, you are put in this dirty corner. Now, where the criminalization of um, crews that um, have been working or are still working in the Central Med um, has been skyrocketed <laughs> over the last um, year, um, it changed again a little bit, but unfortunately, again, in the way of uh, creating heroes by having this story of um, these passionate, well-meaning um, Europeans that go out there to save life and again take away completely um, the actual story that there is to report about, which is um, migration and what we make migration look like. Very, very seldomly is the focus actually on um, what does migration mean, why do the people move, how does it look like, what all has been put in their way to, to keep them away from their freedom um, of movement. So, yeah, mainstream media does what mainstream media does. And But as we could see in this video too, um, there is now the possibility to record video you yourself, do it professionally, documenting the whole situation. How is your personal use or your use as the Sea-Watch organization with the media? Do you like publish or live stream these kind of actions? Do you have a big community that is following you and that is kind of, are you able to also tell your side of the story on a broader scale? Um, for once, I'm not a um, representative uh, of Sea Watch in, in general. I'm just one of the many crew members that, that spent uh, time on board uh, these ships. But yes, uh, we uh, do document what's um, what's happening, partly to um, show what is happening out there, partly to have um, legal um, backups for either what is put in our ways or like in the case of um, this mission from the 6th of November 2017 to um, prove a point for, for people that have been completely depraved, uh, deprived of their rights um, but yeah it's uh, especially within sea watch a matter that's handled very carefully because the there's a lot of ethical questions that go together with that so there wouldn't be any live streaming because these people that are extremely traumatized that are in an extremely vulnerable position cannot be used uh, to create um, images that might be spectacular to look at there's other things then that are um, more important but Yes, in general, there is a lot of people that uh, follow the work um, that it's been doing, and to a certain extent, the, the image has definitely helped to tell the story. Um, I, I remind myself of, a, of an image of a dead child on a, on a, on a beach. Uh, I think it was in Greece or somewhere, and the festival theme is consciousness. And at the time, I think lots of people were really reacting to the image of the dead child on the seashore. Um, Serechko, maybe you can elaborate on that. Obviously, such images create a lot of consciousness about the real wrong that is going on. But what is the level, the next step of actually acting on it? Or is like the news wave washing it away and the next day we think about something else? Or what is the role of the media and in creating these images to move forward? Yeah, I, I think the child was called Aylan Kurdi. Kurdi. Uh, and it's also interesting to note that uh, Operation Sofia basically comes from a child who was born on a German naval ship uh, uh, by a Somali refugee, and then they called her Sofia. Just to see how, how much things changed now that Operation Sofia 
doesn't even have ships anymore, but actually equips the Libyan Coast Guard. I mean, it's it's really uh, consciousness. I I'm tempted to to say that I was walking on the main, uh, and I will say it on the main uh, shopping road uh, here in the Hague, coming here, and then I realized an ad by H and M uh, talking about uh, a conscious fashion something. So I think, unfortunately, the situation is that one day uh, you see a refugee dying, and the other day you go to H&M and you buy a conscious, uh, uh, a conscious uh, whatever, you know, T-shirt. Uh, uh, and I'm not blaming you. We are all involved in this system, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but I think the problem is, uh, uh, I really like what you said, uh, because it, it, it brings me to a parallel. What you said that at the beginning, when the media was following your work, they were presenting you as, you know, these cool young people from Western Europe, they are even female and so on, they have tattoos, you know, you can meet them in Bergheim, it can be any of us, to be a bit cynical. And then later that became completely the opposite, you know, they were, you were criminalized, you became sort of criminals. And uh, didn't the same happen uh, to people such as whistleblowers, such as Chelsea Manning, for instance, or Julian Assange? I remember because uh, uh, Daniel uh, is uh, also a curator, director of a festival in Graz, Elevate Festival, uh, where Julian Assange appeared uh, in, on a live stream. It was only, I think, two years ago or something like that. Now he's in a prison in 23 hours of something which accounts to solitary confinement. So even two years ago, you could listen to someone like him who would say something very smart, much smarter than I can say, uh, much more knowledgeable because he had the, you know, the brutal data about Libya, about Operation Sophia, about some TTIP, about so many other things. Now this person is silenced. Uh, you know that Chelsea Manning is paying a fine of $1,000 a day because she doesn't want to testify against Julian Assange. A fine for being in prison in the Western world. And then we are talking about Russia or China when the same is happening in Western democracies. Uh, so I think we have a huge problem with media and I think the situation is getting worse and worse because what the situation of WikiLeaks showed is that in the same way they are criminalizing humanitarian aid and solidarity, in the same way they are now criminalizing journalism, media and publishing. And if you don't have media or if it is criminalized to talk about human, to talk about crimes uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, for instance, or other sorts of crimes, or why are these crimes happening? Because of oil, because of multinational companies, and so on. If media is criminalized, then basically we don't have any option to read about it. Um, so that's the bad situation. On the other hand, of course, uh, as always, as Plato, Plato already had a term for technology, which he called pharmacon, uh, which Jacques Derrida later used, which means at the same time poison and cure. So on the one hand, you can see this situation, but on the other hand, precisely these tools which they use in order to create a new totalitarian system can be used against them. That's also what you can see beautiful in the video, how you used actually everything what we saw just now and what people can see with their own eyes. Then the next step is, I think, dissemination of these materials. But then again, to be advocatus diaboli, the situation is so bad that to whom do you send the situation now if organizations such as WikiLeaks and so on are criminalized? So it's a vicious circle, but... A vicious circle. And again, for you, if you want to make a statement or a comment, just raise your hand. I'm going to get the microphone to you. Yeah, we have one. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very important presentation. I had a question. We've been hearing the word radical, radicalization a lot. Can you help us out how to become radical? How, at what levels should we become radical? And how could we approach that to become active in your, in your presentation? Well, I think it first starts with um, your own definition of what you deem radical. I think radical also very much is one of these words or radical actions that have been uh, or always painted in a um, very negative way. To me, radical means I want to um, 
do not only cure the symptoms, I want to cure, go to the root of the problem and change something there. And this then goes hand in hand with a lot of self-reflection of like where are you part of um, causing this problem, contributing to the, the problem and really check a lot on yourself um, where uh, what your personal everyday habits, what your life has uh, as a, um, a consequence for others or um, the planet. And in, in general, if you want to think about a, a deeper systematic change, we need uh, in many senses much more solidarity to not be there, help from above, be charitable, but to recognize that other problems are our very own problems, no matter if you notice the consequences in your everyday life or not. And from that, you have to realize that you have to act. It's not good enough to say, oh, I disagree that this is a shame that this journalist uh, is in prison now or that whatever it is from the many million problems that unfortunately we have to um, to deal with, like you need to, and that's something that it's very hard to tell someone like without knowing each other, but it's something like where can you act? You need to act and you need to do it at eyes level with those that need help to, to break through this class system, to break through these privileges and realizing that it's a nice thing to give up on your privileges, which yes, after what society put in your head for I don't know how many years um, uh, is partially definitely a painful <laughs> process to, to go through. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of uh, yeah, self-awareness and reflection. Can I pose your question? Yeah. I think I have, I have it works. Uh, because you said that uh, uh, instead of curing the symptoms, uh, you have to, which I completely agree, you have to tackle the core of the problem. Uh, but yet on the other hand, what, what you were doing uh, was also kind of curing the symptoms. Although I would say it's a most important curing of the symptoms in the sense that you actually did much more than I did, in the sense that you saved or were connected to saving more than 14,000 people. Uh, uh, but then again, my question is, which you mentioned self-reflection, how do you cope with the fact that you are helping these people and you know every person means the whole universe if yeah. you save a person, but at the same time you are aware that even if you help, you know, thousands and thousands, the problem is the system. So how do you personally cope with that? Um, for once, is that I understand the, the work that I've been doing in the Mediterranean, not as uh, humanitarian at all, but as political. And it is just um, a part um, of uh, yeah, a whole worldview or political understanding that, that I have it is indeed not uh, I've been struggling quite a bit actually with the fact that uh, we're always just um, on, when we're working in the Mediterranean um, firefighting for for most um, of the time and that it's who ordered coffee yeah. um, that it's um, that it's sometimes painful to not be more involved uh, or with more time and things that are actually creating free spaces and uh, a solidarian um, society, but yeah, it also cannot, like if you say I do not want to um, only cure the, the symptoms, but I do want to go to the um, to the root of the, the problem, you also have to be very careful that you do not sit still because you haven't found yet the one master plan of how to, to save the world. It's also a very practical decision, like I, I am a captain, I, work, I know ships, I can do this and this skill is needed there, so um, I go, but yeah, as seeing this just as a part of a way bigger approach, um, I somehow get it together in my head. Um, since it was mentioned before, also Sredko mentioned the role of technology. Um, sea Watch uses a lot of technology when they're on board. There's also um, a lot of technology used by Frontex. I think the European Union policy is to invest a lot in technology to also feed like a certain security apparatus like Frontex and others uh, by the use of uh, technology. How do you see that um, in comparison in a way? How important is for you to use technology or to use new technologies? And how do you see that in relation of Frontex actually using technology to uh, keep people out? Um, yeah, of course, there's not a very detailed 
reports about what all Frontex has and uses, but I think we can be relatively sure that uh, if they wanted to, they can find every single little uh, rubber dinghy that's uh, ever going across the, the Mediterranean. Um, see the technology we are working with on a yeah, ship base size is, is not anything fantastically new. It's, it's radars that have been existing for, for decades. It's, uh, it's VHF, sometimes now it's also a visa, so we have internet on board. Um, but it is very um, basic um, marine technology that we're working with. A lot of the, what we do is actually done with binoculars, with uh, crew being on the outlook up in the mast and just staring at the, um, at the horizon um, for hours and hours um, to come. But yeah, the technological... Uh, the yeah, warfare that Frontex... Um, is using is yeah miles ahead of what what we would ever be able um, to afford and uh, yeah I think very very easy for them to control these borders with that. So do you think um, uh, Europe is purposely? I mean, it's obviously clear Frontex is able to recognize any little boat, so it would be possible for the European Union to actually prevent the catastrophe. Absolutely, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely same as it would be absolutely possible for them to not push back people that they have physically in front of them into uh, third countries, into uh, if this in the it is in the Balkan route where it's absolutely horrendous, the, the stories that and the reports that we read from, from there, the the police or military violence against uh, migrants, or if it's um, all the many reports and videos and testimonies and statements that we have from the uh, Greek Turkish um, border definitely that is uh, the one of the main purposes of Frontex to keep the people out if that is that they see them uh, in a control room on a screen and they do not act on it or if it's a physical pushing out of the people okay one and two more from the audience So apart from technology, I'm also interested in the in the human story behind uh, all these forty thousand successful also these forty thousand successful weather. crossings um, that uh, you have been instrumental to bring, to bring about. I'm very curious about the human story. What else, you know, um, who who collaborates in this? I guess that you you need a, a, a human infrastructure to be able to to carry out your work? Who are the invisible faces that we don't see here today that are perhaps not represented in, in this talk that facilitate uh, these 40,000 successful crossings? If you can tell us more about that. Yes, indeed, there's a lot of people um, involved to, to make um, our um, missions possible. There is... Uh, a lot, a lot of different uh, crew, the hundreds of people that uh, throughout the last years have been on board um, the, the ships with various backgrounds, with different amounts of time that they're able to invest in this. There's people um, on land in the ports that are helping with the, with the logistics of equipping the ship, of preparing everything. And then, of course, there's um, the people in the, in the back office that are dealing with the, with the finances, that are dealing with the media um, output. There is a lot, a lot of people that um, volunteer um, their time to, to make this um, happen. And yeah, we're uh, in that sense very lucky that a lot of people um, joined this, this movement over the last um, years to, to keep up with um, this amount of um, work. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of people involved, thankfully. Okay, one more or two more? Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for being here for the work that you do. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you, um, because we are today here as part of a festival that is called Today's Art, so in a way, how do you see, I really like your idea that the work you do is not really humanitarian, but it's part of a, a political work, really. And how do you see the role of art and, and culture more in general in this whole battle? 
uh, yeah, for what is going on in, in the Mediterranean at this moment. And of course, I've, I've seen uh, uh, yeah, the example of, of what forensic architecture or forensic ocean oceanology are doing now. Uh, but yeah, how do you see this, this role and the importance of art in this? Hey, it's going to be very disappointing if I'm going to answer this question because I really do not. Uh, so art is not one of my, let's say, main uh, topics in the, the art that I uh, confront myself most with is uh, indeed more street art and claiming back spaces uh, to that to have yeah, political messages there if it's like by whatever is spray painted, glued on. Um, or what not anyway um, in itself, or if it's yeah claiming a space back um, that should belong to us and not to uh, the H&M commercial, um, for example. Um, but yeah, my uh, my internal philosophical discussion about um, art and uh, political work hasn't gone very far, so I'm sorry I can't give you any amazing insights. <laughs> Sredko, as a philosopher, maybe you can tell us your position on art and politics. Well, I, I love art. <laughs> this is, yeah, 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 you didn't say that. <laughs> so we both love art. Uh, and I also love graffiti art and street art. Uh, but I think the reason why, why art today is, uh, uh, and why it always was important, is uh, I think it goes back, yeah, to philosophy, unfortunately or fortunately. Uh, to the concept which uh, a Russian theorist, who was a theorist and also a Sputnik, how the Russians calls a fellow traveler of the futurists, uh, Viktor Shklovsky, what he calls ostranjenje, uh, 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 which means estrangement, or what Bertolt Brecht uh, would call verfremdung, uh, you know, that uh, uh, an artwork uh, has to literally change your perception on reality, that the art has to change your perception on the world. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, for instance, Shklovsky was writing about a story by Dostoevsky where you can see uh, 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 a story which is uh, written from a perspective of a horse, and then you see the world from the perspective of the horse. Uh, or what Bertolt Brecht was doing was, uh, you know, the, 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 his epic theater where you would have this complete uh, verfremdung and estrangement on the stage of the characters themselves. Uh, an even better definition would be what uh, Darko Suvin, uh, uh, a legend of science fiction, would call cognitive estrangement. Uh, what you can see in science fiction art, for instance, uh, uh, basically that it completely makes a shift in how you perceive reality. Uh, and I think this kind of art we need today more than ever. Uh, I still didn't see the exhibition. I hope there is this kind of art here. And uh, because as soon as you shift your pers perspective and your reality changes, it becomes a political act. Uh, uh, and this is why I think art is always, if it's good art, political. And uh, artists today have a big responsibility and they can actually help a lot. Uh, from musicians, uh, uh, to, to, to painters, to performance artists, to DJs, if you want. Uh, uh, unfortunately, art, as you know, today is very commodified as well. Uh, you have Marina Abramovic, you have an artist who spits on, I'm not talking about her, but there are others who spit on the floor and they get $1 million just because this is art. Uh, uh, you have the commodification of the art market. I think Hito Stel writes about it beautifully in her book, Beauty Free Art, and what's happening with art today. Uh, and luckily, there are artists such as Hito, others. Banksy did a beautiful job also with not only street art, but when he did this dystopian uh, uh, Disneyland and so on, which is precisely what Frank Brecht was claiming, you know, this reality check, reality suddenly appears differently uh, when, for instance, Banksy opened this dystopian uh, uh, Disneyland. So in that sense, yeah, art is very important and we both like, like art. <laughs> yes, and also thanks to do this art and festivals like this that the, topic even, that the topic is even brought up. Um, as a final round, because we're coming to an end, I want to give uh, maybe first to Srečko, then to Pia. Uh, talk about what people can do. What, what would be your advice, your input for everyone on how to act on this subject and maybe in a larger context? 
Yeah, it's a question which Lenin already posed. <laughs> what, what is to be done? And it's a question which we are posing constantly all the time. I'm not someone here to tell you what you can do. Uh, uh, I'm doing the best I can. I think you're doing the best you can. We always think that we are not doing enough. Just by sitting here with you, I think that I'm really not... What I'm doing is compared like this to what you're doing. Uh, but I think this shouldn't scare us. Uh, as Spinoza, who is from here, uh, said, uh, uh, there is no fear without hope, and there is no hope without fear. So as long as there are people like Pia or other ac courageous activists, uh, uh, I think there is hope. Uh, of course, this hope comes from fear that we will not be able to prevent the catastrophe, which is already happening. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, as long as there is fear, there is always hope. Uh, uh, I don't want to go so far, but I think these people who were drowning here, uh, even if they were scared, uh, they had hope. And I keep, as we know from Greek mythology, hope is the last thing which dies. And so instead of giving a big narrative, you should, you know, join a political party or I don't know what, or become a captain yourselves, uh, uh, which is very difficult, uh, I think each and every one of us should just do the best we can. Uh, but this is not enough. I don't want to end like this new age uh, bullshit, you know, everyone can, you know, you look at a flower and it's a good smell and then you're changing the world, whatever. Uh, uh, no, I think the next step is after you realize what are the best skills you have, I think then the next step is to connect to people who, uh, who think in a similar manner, not necessarily the same, because people can sometimes change their opinions as well, uh, with people who have other skills. Uh, as you said, there are so many people who are behind Sea-Watch. In the same way, I can say there are so many people behind uh, uh, more than 100,000 members of DiEM25, uh, programmers, volunteers going on the street, uh, distributing leaflets, uh, people who cook for refugees. Uh, there are so many ways in which I think everyone can be helpful, but the necessary thing is to connect. Uh, because on the other side, what you can see is, of course, Silicon Valley realized that connection can be commodified as well. And if you look at Bilderberg or Davos and so on, you can see that mon monopoly capitalism basically functions on very good connections so that today you can fill up a bus with 50 people who would have more money than 3.5 billion uh, inhabitants of planet Earth. So if they are connecting, we should connect. If they are using technology, we should use the technology. If they are using their skills, we should use our skills. And that would be my message, which I'm hopeful that it's a bit more hopeful than what we were discussing before. <laughs> Your message, Pia. Yes, you might have realized I'm not the, the best motivational speaker in the, in the house. So what he said and um, <laughs> well, I hope that people um, get much better in um, taking up responsibility, realizing what all is in their responsibility, but also seeing the freedom that goes hand in hand with that of taking and making conscious decisions and that this is not something that can only be done in your head by thinking a lot about it, but that it's something that has to result in um, actual actions and moving and changing things. So I thank you both. Um, I guess it's good for a round of applause. Thank you, Zrechko. Thank you, Pia. And thanks, the audience. And thanks, Daniel. And yeah, seawatch.org or something, you can probably donate. That's a little thing that everybody can do. We are here in the Netherlands, people have money. Donate some money, get out on the street. For me, the climate movement yesterday was a big proof that there is a lot of things possible with millions of people going on the street. I would wish we also go on the street for the people who are drowning in the Mediterranean. Thanks, and I hope your consciousness was raised and you put it to act somewhere. Thank you.